Thank you very much. We turn now to topical questions and we begin with a question from Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the deployment of armed police and the use of tasers. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, police Scotland is proposing a limited extension of the role of armed response vehicle officers to allow them to deploy to non firearms incidents. The deployment of ARV officers to such incidents will be the responsibility of the initial tactical firearms commanders in the three regional control centres using their professional judgment to support local policing as and when required. The new model uh, will allow these highly trained ARV officers to make a valuable contribution to policing in their communities with a focus on vulnerability and speed of response. The proposals are present, were presented to the Scottish Police Authority meeting this morning. The board also considered Police Scotland's proposal to make an additional 50 tasers available across local divisions. Frontline police officers are facing an increased threat and a greater number of incidents involving bladed weapons and other violence. The availability of taser will offer officers greater protection, the opportunity to resolve issues more rapidly and reduce the risk of harm to the public and the offender. Police Scotland proposed to begin the selection process for around 500 officers to be trained to carry taser. This specially, these specially trained officers will be deployed at the heart of local policing in all 13 divisions across Scotland, helping to keep their colleagues and the public safe. The Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland will keep both these issues under regular review. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that detailed response. But for those of us uh, that are worried that this policy is part of a slippery slope towards an enforcement model of policing. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary provide that consideration will be given to scaling back the deployment of armed uh, police and tasers in the event that the threat to officers and the public reduces? That this isn't just uh, a one-way shift towards uh, universal arming. And does he share the concern of Dr Nick McCarroll, uh, law lecturer at Glasgow Caledonian University, uh, who appears to question whether the force is taking advantage of what he calls a vacuum of accountability at the top of policing in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so officer, with regards to his latter point regarding uh, Dr uh, Nick McCarroll, uh, the answer to that is no. Um, this is an issue which you may well be aware that Police Scotland have been planning for for a number of months and provided a briefing to uh, party spokespersons, including his own party leader, um, a number of weeks ago about their plans and their thinking around this issue. Um, it was delayed in terms of the announcement as a result of some of the changes at the head of uh, Police Scotland, namely that of uh, ACC Bernie Higgins. However, uh, the paper then went to the SPA board the, uh, this morning and uh, Police Scotland set out the details of that last week because the paper was in the public domain at that point. So to suggest that this is in some way to do with a, a vacuum around accountability is simply inaccurate and misleading. In relation to the wider point that the member made uh, uh, regarding uh, deployment of firearms officers and increasing the number, the member will recall that I set out uh, last year the increase in firearms officers which were required due to the uh, level of threat which we faced um, as a country overall and the additional deployment which would come about through that. This announcement does not involve an increase in firearms officers. It is the use of existing firearms officers who are presently only deployed to incidents which either involve a threat to life or to a firearms incident itself. However, where the tactical firearms uh, officer believes that they could be deployed to an incident where there's particular vulnerability uh, or where there is a need for speed and an ARV is available to respond to that quickly, then to be able to deploy them to that incident in order to deal with it at that particular point to support local policing. So it does not involve an increase in firearms officers as such. And the uh, provision of the uh, TASER, uh, specially trained officers, is to help to support both public protection and also officer, officer protection because of the number of increasing incidents that they're experiencing where violence or a bladed instrument is being used, which clearly has a risk to police officers. And I'm sure the member will recognise that there's also a duty of care to police officers in making sure that they're appropriately equipped to be able to deal with these types of incidents as and when they occur in order to bring them to an end quickly. Lee MacArthur. Thank you. And on the latter point, I certainly uh, agree. I don't think anybody uh, would dispute the fact that police officers need to have the tools um, to keep both themselves but also the public safe, including the deployment of 
armed officers. But that is not the same, however, as accepting that we should have armed police officers attending at all forms of incidents uh, as a matter of routine. The deployment model uh, under SPA scrutiny uh, today proposes that armed officers may attend cases involving, for example, a dom domestic dispute. Uh, the public will rightly be concerned that the presence of an armed officer may heighten such a situation. Does the Cabinet Secretary uh, share any of those concerns? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I think the member is misunderstanding the deployment model which Police Scotland are intending to take forward. Uh, the member makes reference to them being uh, used for routine policing purposes, which is simply not the case. They are there to help to support local policing and where the tactical firearms officer determines that there is a need uh, to respond quickly and that there is a vulnerability and that they have an ARV able to respond to that more quickly than local policing to be able to do so. So the member uses the gives the example of uh, a domestic incident. If we had a situation where a woman was under threat from her partner at home and there was an ARV quite literally sitting round the corner that could respond to that call but did not do so because of the existing deployment model and they would have to wait for five or ten minutes before local policing could arrive to it. I suspect most members in the chamber would say I would prefer that the ARV to respond as quickly as possible yeah. if they're able yeah. to get there more quickly and that's exactly what this new deployment model is about. It's not about using them for normal routine policing matters, it's to allow the tactical firearms officer to make a decision that if the ARV officers are closer at hand to respond to someone who's vulnerable or where there is a, a particular issue about responding quickly to be able to deploy those officers and I would have thought all members would recognise that's about making use of the very high skills that these officers have and it's also worth keeping in mind presiding officers ARV officers are police officers first who are highly trained in firearms capability as well and the intention is and it is this government's clear intention that Police Scotland remains an unarmed police force but with a specialist armed capability that can be deployed as and when necessary. And that will continue to be the case with this change to its deployment model. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that where an allegation has been made of improper use of firearms, it is necessary for public transparency, trust in the police, and to ensure learning outcomes are developed, that a full investigation takes place? Cabinet Secretary. Epstein offered, yeah, yes, that is the case. And of course, uh, any time when a, a firearm uh, is used by uh, Police Scotland or where by firearms officer or where a taser is used by, uh, by Police Scotland officers, that the matter is automatically referred to the Police Investigation Review, Review Commissioner to evaluate the use at that particular point and whether they uh, operated within the normal standard operating procedure within uh, Police Scotland. So every time a, firearms, uh, a, a firearm is used or a taser is used by Police Scotland, it is automatically referred to the Police Investigation Review Commissioner to consider the matter. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, if following the integration of BTP Scotland into Police Scotland, will those BTP officers who carry tasers be included in the figure of 500 officers to be equipped with tasers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, BTP officers only have a very limited capacity around uh, taser capacity, um, and they have no firearms capacity in Scotland at all. Um, any firearms capacity that's delivered within a railway system in Scotland is delivered by Police Scotland because BTP don't have that special zone uh, here in Scotland. One of the reasons why I believe it should be within a single command structure. Um, but, but the issue about the taser officers is of a, a, a limited support that is provided to BTP at the present moment through their overall UK approach to matters. And it will be an operational matter for the Chief Constable to determine whether they continue to be uh, taser officers uh, are included within that 500 or whether they uh, supplement that 500. But what I can assure the member of is that overall within Police Scotland, their intention is to have 500 specially trained officers to be able to support local policing as and when it's appropriate. John Finney. Uh, thank you. Cabinet Secretary, you've told us the existing model is flawed. You're commending a new model. Um, you're seeing a situation where a largely defensive police service has an increasing offensive capacity. The Scottish Green Party don't oppose these moves at all. Briefing or meeting with parliamentarians does not equate to consultation. Will you encourage Police Scotland to publish both risk assessments, the one for the existing model and for the proposed model, if it's not already been agreed, in order that we can have the fullest discussion about what's supposed to purport to evidence the need for these uh, changes, please? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, in relation to the uh, policy <coughs> intentions behind this, it was set out in the paper which was published by the Scottish Police Authority um, last week and was considered by the Scottish Police Authority uh, the, uh, today uh, around the deployment model for both uh, firearms officers and also uh, for uh, the use of taser. What I would uh, uh, assure the member of is that I believe that if there is an ARV uh, uh, nearby that can respond to an incident where there is a need for uh, a quick response or where there's a particular issue of vulnerability that we should utilize we should utilize the skills of we should utilize the skills of those officers to be able to do that and the new deployment model allows that to happen under the command of the tactical firearms commander who will decide on whether it's appropriate or not. This will not be a decision that will be made by the local police commander. It's a, a decision which will be made by the tactical firearms uh, commander. And Police Scotland will set out the rationale as to why that's the case, in order to ensure that there's appropriate control and decision-making around these issues. And it's also been set out very clearly, I believe, by the Scottish Police Federation about why they believe it's important that their officers have the appropriate uh, protective equipment to deal with issues where it involves violence or weapons, and that tasers could be an important, can play an important role in helping to address those incidents in bringing them to a quicker end and also in helping to protect officers and the public. <coughs> Having said that, though, this is not about simply using them on a proactive basis on an ongoing basis. It is to support local policing and they will be deployed as and when it's appropriate by local commanders. So there is a clear process in determining when they'll be used and how they will be used. And I believe that the new deployment model in both these areas will help to support local policing in addressing issues more effectively. Thank you. Question number two, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the findings by the Institute for Public Policy Research Scotland that the budget for day-to-day -day spending is expected to fall by 250 million between 2018-19 and 2019-20. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <coughs> Can I first of all formally welcome James Kelly as the finance spokesperson as appointed today uh, to his uh, new role. In my budget statement last Thursday, I was clear about the detrimental impact that UK government austerity is having on this Scottish budget highlighting that over the 10-year period to 2019-20, Scotland's block grant will have been cut by £2.6 billion in real terms. I also quoted from the Fraser of Allender Institute, who said that by 2019-20, the resource block grant will be around £500 million lower in real terms than in 17-18. Monday's analysis by IPPR Scotland simply reiterates these points and confirms that the Scottish Government is facing significant and damaging real terms cuts to our budget for day-to-day -day spending as a result of that continuing UK Government austerity. In order to mitigate those cuts, protect our NHS and other public services, and to support our economy, we have reformed income tax in Scotland, our only significant fiscal lever to provide growth in our tax revenues. Of course, while we have taken action to protect public services, the best way to stop public sector cuts would be for the UK government to end their damaging austerity and invest in public services and the economy. James Kelly. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his welcome to my post and I look forward to constructive exchanges. With that in mind, I'm sure he'll be concerned that his budget has begun to unravel since he last uh, spoke from that position on Thursday, because it's not just the IPPR analysis. We know from SPICE that there's a real terms cut in local government funding of £135 million. And we also know that there's not funding been put in place in order to address the issue of the, 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 the pay increases. And in terms of these local councils, it's not just the numbers, it's the effect in local areas, the job losses, the closure of day centres, the reduction in library services. So will the Cabinet Secretary uh, accept, in effect, he misled Parliament last Thursday, and will he revise the, the budget allocations in order to produce a fair settlement for local government? Cabinet Secretary. I can assure James Kelly that the uh, budget is perfectly intact. I think I gave it a fair presentation last week, over a half hour uh, contribution, then an hour worth of questions. There's much detail in the documentation and I'm glad that members will have had more time to look over it to see what a, a productive and positive budget that it is. 
uh, investing in many parts of the public sector as well as ensuring its right environment for business growth as well. Why is that important? So that we can grow our revenues, uh, ensure that employment is at a high level and ensure fair and, uh, uh, social justice uh, also, specifically in relation to local government. I set out the figures uh, to the Chamber uh, and those uh, numbers remain the same, which was essentially a cash freeze in resource terms uh, with more in capital. And I pointed out that if uh, local authorities use their council tax powers up to a 3% increase, that would put their budgets in the real terms increase as well. So I think James Kelly is right to point to the analysis about the real terms reduction to Scotland's budget. Uh, of course, that concerns us uh, in progressive parties, uh, and that's why we're using the powers and levers that we have got to protect the people of Scotland from this right-wing austerity and in so doing ensure that our frontline services are adequately funded. In relation to pay, I set out uh, pay policy, uh, which I think is fair, uh, recognising the cost of living uh, for public sector workers. I don't uh, set local government's pay, but I do believe that local government is adequately resourced so that they can have a fair settlement as well. Uh, but that, uh, sorry, a fair settlement, and that is really now for a, a matter for local authority to engage on. Uh, just as I look forward to further engagement uh, with James Kelly, I also look forward to further engagement with COSLA. James Kelly. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary said that one of the levers at his disposal was tax, but in looking at the Fraser of Allender Institute analysis, although £164 million would be raised through the tax changes, when account is taken of business rates relief and other factors, there's only actually £28 million available uh, for investment in other areas of the budget. And the reality is that the tax policy is all over the place. I mean, how can it be fair that some of those between 43,525 and 58,500 pay less tax, but those between 24,000 and 43,525 pay, pay more. The reality is that the tax policy is not coherent and it's not delivering for social justice. So will, he, will the Cabinet Secretary redraft that tax policy to produce a fair and consistent set of rates which will deliver a, a proper set, settlement for much needed investment in Scotland's communities. Cabinet Secretary. If, if even uh, the Daily Record is uh, describing me as uh, Robin Hood of Holyrood, I suppose I must be doing something right in their eyes, and, and that's the, the view of the, the Daily Record in terms of the progressivity of our uh, tax system. But it is true to say um, we are trying to create the conditions for economic growth, so our business rates policies uh, absolutely do that. Uh, James Kelly referenced uh, one of the elements as part of that package. To take an example in non-domestic rates, uh, alios, by not uh, lifting the relief that the alios uh, were receiving, was welcomed by local government. In fact, if memory serves me correctly, welcomed by the Labour Party. So I think there's a range of decisions that are set in the, uh, the right uh, context and circumstances. But overall on tax, we are raising more to ensure that the real terms reduction that we received uh, from the right-wing Tory government is essentially overturned by our decisions, good governance and the tax decisions that we've been able to take. Uh, that is progressive. In recalibrating and resetting the overall tax structure, it is fairer, it is more progressive. Uh, more than 70% of taxpayers, of course, uh, will pay less. Uh, those earning under £33,000 uh, will pay less, whilst also raising more for our public services. Now, in the documentation that I've published, it shows that it could be described as an anomaly where last year we uh, froze the threshold for the higher rate. We were proposing to increase the threshold for the higher rate uh, this year in this budget. So the anomaly that's created there is just part of resetting the whole system. But overall, it uh, is more progressive and certainly it uh, ensures that we've turned real terms decline uh, into a positive. It's resetting this in a way that uses our power uh, to absolutely protect frontline services and also properly uh, reward our public servants. Kev Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what alternative balanced tax and spending proposals the Labour Party has brought forward? And does agree that it is simply not credible for Labour to assert that austerity can be ended by this Parliament without specifying exactly how? Cabinet Secretary. Well, to be fair, the economy has faced some turbulence and the Labour Party has faced some turbulence as well over the recent period. There has been a change in leadership and spokespeople, uh, but the last remaining information I had was uh, uh, engagement from Alec uh, Rowley. There was a proposition that was costed in our discussion paper on the role of income tax uh, in Scotland, and we modelled the 
uh, position of the Labour Party, which essentially would put a penny on the basic uh, rate. Of course, that's not what the government's proposed. Actually, our starter rate, if you compare that now to the basic rate of what Labour would have proposed as a 2p uh, difference uh, in uh, the pound. So the government's taken a methodical approach to this. We engaged in, with stakeholders. Uh, we uh, have uh, set out our progressive plans and it's met the four tests that we have uh, set out about a more progressive system, protecting lower income earners, uh, ensuring that we protect uh, public services and supporting the economy as well. And it does, uh, it, it does stand out in sharp uh, contrast to the, the chaotic position of the Labour Party. However, that said, uh, with a, a, a shadow uh, a cabinet uh, now in place, uh, maybe the Labour Party will want to come and see me with constructive proposals going forward as the, we take the budget through the legislative process of the Scottish Parliament. Bill Bowman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Fiscal Commission is forecasting continued slow growth with the resultant 2.1 billion decrease in tax revenue. What is the Cabinet Secretary's preference to make up the shortfall, cuts to public spending or further tax rises? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, uh, Bill Bowman is certainly the man to ask uh, there because I was to follow the Tories' tax policies, I'd have to find another £501 million for next year from frontline public services to fund the position of the uh, Tory tax rises, uh, sorry, it would be tax cuts, of course, uh, for the Tories, tax cuts for the richest in society, whether it's big business, property owners, uh, or those in income tax as well. So actually my balanced budget will allow us to invest in the economy, deliver tax in a fair and progressive way, and invest in our public services, turning it into real terms growth. In terms of the uh, Fiscal Commission's uh, forecast, I'm sure that Bill Bowman, uh, being assiduous as he is, has actually looked at the full detail of the report. And they identify issues in there about productivity, a uh, working age uh, population and levels of employment uh, as well. The greatest threat on all those indicators uh, is actually the Tory party. Your mismanagement of uh, Brexit, the decisions you've taken, the ongoing austerity, uh, the attacks uh, on those with the least, all of that is what's compounded the problem and presents the greatest risk to our economy in the UK and specifically to Scotland. But in the face of those cuts to the Scottish budget, in the face of that uh, uncertainty, and in the face of the mishandling of the Brexit negotiations, this Scottish Government is investing in our economy and in our people through skills and innovation and business growth, through uh, education and infrastructure to ensure that Scotland is the best place to live, work and invest. And although the Fiscal Commission's forecasts, uh, some would argue, are a bit cautious, EY, for example, gave a far more uh, positive and higher uh, forecast in terms of economic growth. Uh, we will invest in the economy to ensure that we're in a stronger position. Thank you very much to Cabinet Secretary and members. That concludes topical questions.